So I want to say good morning to those of you who are still enjoying your first cup of coffee or tea like I am. And good afternoon to those of you who are joining us in the middle of your work day. And good evening to those of you who are maybe staying up a little past your bedtime to be here with us. My name is Theo Stano Stunfi, and I'm the president and executive director of Global Citizen Circle. And I want to thank everyone for being here today. For those of you who are new to Global Citizen Circle, I'll tell you that it began almost 50 years ago during another period of upheaval in the United States. And I think it's fair to say that it was the civil rights movement in large part that moved Global Citizen Circle's founders to do the right now stuff where they could. And that was to bring together people of diverse backgrounds and opinions in dialogue to foster constructive change. Almost a half a century later, Global Citizen Circle is still doing just that. But today, we're all here because we know that talk alone won't get the job done. We must take action. So today, we focus on action for justice now. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a quick rundown of the format for today's circle. We're gonna start by hearing from our amazing discussion leaders who will share their stories of activism for justice and equity. And as you may have heard, we're recording this part of the program. Then we'll divide up into smaller discussion groups where you'll have a chance to talk about the kinds of actions you're taking or would like to be taking. Um, and then we'll all come back together after 20, 20 minutes of discussion um, to hear some highlights from a few of the groups. And if all goes smoothly and according to our schedule, we should be wrapping up uh, the program in about an hour and a half. Um, so that would be 1130 Eastern time. So now I'd like to turn my attention to our moderator today, Commissioner Rodney Ellis of Harris County in Houston, Texas. We are so honored to have Rodney serve as a member of the Global Citizen Circle Board of Directors and to count him as a dear friend. For those of you who know him or follow him on social media, you know he never, ever stops. Whether he's loading boxes and bags of food into cars of those in need, speaking up and fighting for criminal justice reform through his work with the Innocence Project, or riding his bike across the state of Texas, raising awareness for a righteous cause. His commitment to helping improve the lives of those most in need, not only in Texas, but around the world is unwavering. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Rodney Ellis to you and pass the, vir the virtual microphone onto him to get us started. Rodney. You know, uh, thank you and thank you for the gr great work that you've done putting this together. I think I sent you a uh, email about two in the morning. And of course, it's because I got one from Nadine shortly ahead of that, but she's in a different time zone. Uh, I guess first I'll tell you what a county commissioner is. I'm in Houston. Harris County is about 5 million people. It is the, the most diverse county uh, in America. Uh, I also reside in the most diverse city in the country. And Texas, for what it's worth, is not what you think about in the wild, wild west. We're one of four majority minority states in America, fueled in part by our large Latinx population, our African-American population, of course, our Anglo population as well. We also have a, a increasingly growing South Asian community. I uh, first got introduced to the uh, Global Citizen Circle when it was a New England circle. Uh, I went to work for then Congressman Nikki Leland in 1980 or 81. At 66, I can't remember, but I was a young lad, about 26 or 27, and uh, he kept talking about this friend, Jerry Dunphy. So I got invited up to a Dunphy estate in uh, New Hampshire. And it was a fundraiser for Andrew Young, who was running for mayor of Atlanta then. Mayor Jackson was stepping down. And I got to meet all of the titans of the civil rights community. Coretta Scott King was there, uh, Jesse Jackson. I'll never forget, it was the first time I, in my life I'd ever seen lobster 
although I'm 50 miles from the coast in Galveston, we just didn't eat lobster. We ate crawfish, not crayfish, crawfish. But of all people, this brilliant, powerful woman sitting next to me could tell how ignorant I was, and she explained to me how to eat lobster. It was Coretta Scott King. Now, here's what's interesting. Then a freshman congressman, Ed Markey, didn't know how to eat it either. So she taught him how to eat lobster as well. I have traveled the world uh, at circles in South Africa, in Ireland. Uh, Nadine and Jerry have mentored me from being a young man and always taught me to reach back and try to mentor the next generation. That's why I'm glad to be with all these panelists. We're here today because criminal justice reform is truly the international human rights, civil rights issue of our day. I'm honored to be here from Texas, the home of George Floyd, because it is this recent tragedy that has globalized international attention. Uh, I made the comment to Nadine and Jerry when they called me once. Uh, maybe Jerry called a couple times during the funeral when he heard my, my name called out. And uh, I made the comment, we got to figure out how to do some right now stuff because we've been here before. Some of the panelists that I'll introduce shortly uh, had that moment in the spotlight. And these are powerful women who have used their voices to try to bring about systemic change. I want you to remember two fives. In Texas, we round stuff off. We're about 5% of the world's population in America. 5% of the world's population in the United States. We're 25% of the world's prison population. Now, something's wrong with that. You ought to Google in policing in America. I don't know about worldwide, but how it started in America. Jerry, the first one was in Boston. Second one, I think I saw this in Time Magazine. I think it was uh, Philadelphia. In the South, when policing came about, <clears throat> it was primarily because they were old squads to go after formerly enslaved people. First one in North Carolina. Our system in this country has systematic racism in it, tremendous inequities in it. We ask police officers to do too much. We ask them to go deal with all of the inequities in society. We, every county jail in America is the largest mental health ward whether you're in Cook County, LA County, Harris County is the third or fourth largest county in the country now. We're behind LA, then you can count New York, not quite a city, but the New York region, then Cook County, Chicago, then Harris County. On the local level, here's what I've done over the years. Uh, years ago, when I was in the state Senate, I was working on criminal justice reforms in, in part inspired by the work of the Dunphy family and people I've met, you know, folks in South Africa. Uh, over, over the years, I uh, ended up being chair of the Board of the Innocence Project out of New York. I think they wanted somebody with a Southern draw. They needed a Texas state senator who was trying to pass reforms. I did that 14 years. I'd take every one of these tragedies of a wrongful conviction and see what policy implications could come out of it. I met a young guy, I think in Austin when I was in the state senate some years ago, who was trying to sue Austin, Texas, Travis County, for bail reform. He thought they were liberal, and he'd go after bail bonding industry. I made the comment, you think they're liberal till you start messing with those bail bondsmen. I convinced him to sue Harris County. And then a couple of years later, a good friend passed away. I decided to leave a 26-year career, third and senior in the Texas Senate, although I was in the minority party as a Democrat, and run for county commission. Had no idea how much power was in this position. We control the indigent defense system. We control on the county level, indigent health care system. Uh, there's a bail reform case, and I'm gonna close on this, just as a reform, some of y'all to think about. We took that old bail system from England, they got rid of it. We keep people in jail if you can't afford to pay a fine to post a bond. The Rodney Ellis of the day, I could post bond. The Rodney Ellis where I started in that poor low income neighborhood, my life would have been differently if I'd gotten arrested for some of the same things people I'm looking at on this screen did. But you had wealth, you had parents, you had connections, you got out. We ought to reform bail in this country. We ought to focus on energy and defense. Uh, we ought to look at not 
programming so much money into law enforcement and give people mental health or drug treatment when they need it. Now I want to turn to some powerful women. I've talked to much enough, Theo, and I'm trying my best. You know I'm from Texas to stick to my time slot, but I didn't put my watch on. The first powerful woman, Nina Simone said it best. All of them are young, gifted, and black. Or at least they got a black heart uh, from having dealt with these issues, even if they happen to not be of African descent. First one is Emerald Snipes Garner. She's the youngest daughter of Eric Garner. I mentioned earlier, we've been here before, before Mr. Floyd, and she can recount me the names. Her father died. Uh, he was, after being restrained in a chokehold by police in New York City in 2014. Emerald has worked tirelessly since her father's death to pass meaningful legislation. She's gonna talk about her latest victory, which will be many of a strain. When she works on that Southern draw, I'm gonna have her come testify in Texas. Uh, but she's worked on criminal offense, law enforcement offices uh, to stop the use of chokeholds on suspects. Uh, please welcome, you can't clap, but I'll give you some applause. Emerald will be our first speaker. Thank you, Emerald. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for um, allowing me to share my story on such a great platform. Um, I just, uh, I just want to send my thank yous to everyone, including, you know, Tito. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this um, program. Thank you, Theo, and everybody over at Global Citizen for having me. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> um, it's been a rough journey. It's been, um, it's been emotional. It's been up and down. It's been a lot of anger, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. But as um, my brother, <laughs> my new brother in the movement, Rodney, has said, we have a victory. Um, you know, in my father's case, um, Daniel Pantaleo, the former uh, police murderer of my father, he was not fired until five years later. He didn't face any criminal, um, any, any criminal, um, you know, accountability for what he did to my father. And, you know, I felt hopeless. I felt like, you know, we're never going to get justice. Nothing is ever going to happen. So um, when our brother George Floyd was killed, I was just like, you know what? Enough is enough. Like we are here five years later, almost six years later, my father is gone, there's no accountability and then you choke someone else to death, this is unacceptable. So we need change and we need change now. So I started to reach out. Um, I got in contact with, uh, through Angelique, I got in contact with Violence in Boston. They were, they, uh, we planned a national call. We were all on the call. Um, Kirsten, uh, Senator J Kirsten Gillibrand, she wants, to, she wants to reintroduce the bill on a federal level. And I thought that I was gonna have to call and rally and, and text and, you know, get everybody involved to reintroduce it on the federal level. And then just so happened the day of our national call, she called us. So what we're working on now is that um, in New York state, the Eric Garner chokehold bill was passed. So that means that if you administer a chokehold as a police officer, you'll be fired, arrested, and prosecuted. No questions asked. Um, there will be no, an, another Pantaleo situation would not happen. So um, you will carry, it, it carries a sentence of up to three and a half years, from three and a half years to 15 years. So the chokehold is now illegal in New York in New York State. So what I'm trying to do, which I'm working on my working with my elected official, um, Congressman Brian Benjamin, and he is uh, Senator Brian Benjamin, and he is going to help me to take the Eric Garner chokehold bill to to the United States, across the United States. Every state should have a ban on chokeholds, and that's what I'm working for. So we're going to be working on that, and I'm also trying to get it passed on a federal level. So we're leaning on our Democratic states to pass it locally, and we're leaning on our Republicans to pass it federally. So um, how you can help is you can follow me on social media. You can uh, email me at thisstopstoday2014 at gmail.com. I can drop that in the chat, and um, maybe we can reach out to you and find out who your elected officials are. We can talk to them about passing the, passing the law in your state. Um, I do a lot of work with Angie, and um, I'm going to continue to work with Angie. And we are not a survivor. We are not an act activist group. We are not activists. We are not politicians. We call ourselves survivors because I'm tired of looking at myself as a victim. For five years, I felt like a victim, and I'm not a victim anymore. I lost my sister at 27 years old to a massive heart attack, and she left behind two children that I'm now taking care of. So this is very much. It's much more serious for me because I lost my father. 
and then I lost my sister. So, um, and, you know, I have my daughter and her two children. Her son was four months when he when she passed away. So I I have a brand new baby. He's two now, and I have my niece who was my my sister my sister's daughter, and she was my baby before I had my daughter. So, um, you know, now we all live together. We're a big strong family, and I do everything that I do for them. And I when my my nephew's name is Eric. And I don't want my nephew to become a hashtag, nor do I want my niece or my daughter to become a hashtag. So I am looking for global change. So it's just ironic and uh, fun that, you know, global citizens, global change. So I was just like, wow, like, this is amazing. I feel like God is talking to me and he's telling me that now is the time. And thank you so much. I'll drop my email into the chat and I would love to become, a I would love to be a part of any further discussions. If you need to know anything, uh, let me know. And if I, if I don't know, I'll find someone who does. Thank you guys so much. Imaru, thank you. That was just wonderful. Thank you for turning your tragedy into such an inspirational story. Uh, Jerry and I look forward to meeting you and hugging you in person and doing that five boroughs ride in New York with you and all of those young ones. Uh, yes. <laughs> our next speaker is Angelique Negroni Curse. Angelique, if I butchered the middle name, I, name, I am from Texas. Uh, after the death of her husband, Andrew, in 2017, Angie has rallied with Black Lives Matter and advocated for the Andrew Curse Act in Congress to hold police liable for denying medical care to people I in custody. I can't hear. Yo, you, this shit is messing up. Oh. Can I'm you sorry, you guys hear me? I don't hear me. I can't hear you. <laughs> we can hear you, Angie. I, can hear you. I really can't hear you, so I'm gonna I'm just wing it, okay? So let's just let's go like this. Um, my name is Angelique Negroni Kears. I'm the wife of Andrew Kears. Um, um, my husband was killed on May 11, 2017, from Schenectady Police Department. Um, Ronnie, I don't know what you said, so I'm gonna just tell you tell the story. I apologize because I really can't hear anything. I don't know. You're doing I'm well. Um, okay. Um, my my husband Andrew Kears begged for his life over 70 times within 17 minutes and died in the back of the police car. My husband stated that he could not breathe, and the officers denied him each and every time his 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 pleas for help. The off, my officer, Mark Weeks, stated that, you know, my husband, my Andrew said, can you open the window? Officer Mark Weeks says, no. He says, I'm feeling, I'm, uh, he goes, I, I feel like throwing up. Mark Weeks says, don't throw up in my car. He says, I'm, I'm feeling dizzy and I'm getting numb. And each and every time that Andrew pleaded for his life, the officer Mark Weeks denied him each and every time the medical assistance that he needed. He died one minute before he got to the police station. And as he got to the police station, Mark Weeks takes his time to get him out of my house. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> it's the back. Um, That's all right. Officer Mark Weeks takes his time to, you know, to get him to get to get him out and, and put him on the on the, the concrete. They're still not calling the ambulance, still not um um they're not checking his pulse or anything. Then you see all these officers coming out of the Scandinavian Police Department stating that um, um, they start drinking coffee, they're laughing, not getting Andrew any kind of help, not even, you know, come, um, um, doing CPR. One of the captains goes to Mark Weeks and he states, oh, what happened? Mark Weeks says, oh, he was doing that I can't breathe thing all the way here. It took them um, a long time to do CPR. It took them a long time to do to get the defibrillators. After they got the defibrillators, you see Mark Weeks goes to the patrol car. He leans over into the open window, and then he starts crying. And then another officer rubs him on the back, and he and you see him then you know take him away. They took a long time for the ambulance to come, and they're gonna say that Andrew died in the hospital. Andrew died in the back of the police car. From that day on, I said to myself that I will be his voice, I will get him justice, and I promise that he will not be another black man gone from the police, okay? I, it's been a hard, long three years of struggling, three years of pain, three years of crying, three years of, of just a lot. <laughs> Finally, 
Monday, his his law got passed, which is the Andrew Kears Act. And I, you know, it's, it's just, I'm so overwhelmed with feelings and emotions and, 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 you know, and victory, you know, because like I said, Andrew begged for his life for over 70 times within 17 minutes and died. He literally said, I'm begging you, please. And Mark Weeks was like a serial killer with no empathy. So this win for Andrew is a win for us all, is, is, is a um is in New York State. It's called the Andrew Kids Act, and that is, is civil at this moment. Okay, but that means that we could go after their pocket individually, the officer, CEO, um, um, transit police, anything is 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 uh, any mental mental health as, issues as well. So basically, if they have a house, I'm coming for you. If they have a freaking <laughs> of their pension, I'm coming for it. And and if they have a little freaking um um their any kind of their money, we're gonna come for it. So basically, you we just you know once you come for their money, they're gonna be held accountable one way or another. I'm also doing it nationally with with Senator um, Warren and Congresswoman Presley. They they and I need each and every one of you. Mom, on the, on the thing, I need we each and I'm sorry, I got seven kids, guys. I apologize. <laughs> we, we love um, it. Keep it I real. Got, um, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I want each and every one of you to go to your politicians to help me get this passed because, like I said, if he had to die in that manner just to save one, that he didn't die in vain. I, and if anybody doesn't know my husband's story, you could go on YouTube is, and you, you put in Andrew Kiss, um, um dash cam. And tell me what you think, because I'm, I'm his wife. I see something different than what you got. And, and, and if you feel that, you know, Mark Weeks killed him, because I believe he did, you know what I'm saying? Then share it. Put your comments. Make it go, you know, viral, because the world needs to know what happened to Andrew Kidd. His voice needs to be heard, because, like I said, he begged for his life over 70 times, and it, his, his cries of help was, was diminished by this officer, of Mark Weeks, this overseer, just a blatant of, of regard for human life. And like I keep saying, if you want a life of crime with no jail time, just be a cop. Thank you and justice for Andrew Kears. Thank you, Angie. That was just wonderful. And uh, we, we know that in this age of uh, social distancing, <laughs> we all, hey, that's why I came to the, that's why I'm glad I could come to the office because all of my kids are back home and they're grown. And it's a mess with all of them in the house. Uh, but thank you for what you do, and you're such an inspiration. Uh, your case was also used in New York for uh, Governor Cuomo and the legislators passing the strongest discovery statute in America. So each one of these cases, we ought to look at them, is like when an airplane goes down, they go in and see what went wrong, what ought to be changed. The next panelist is Monica Cannon Grant. Monica is one of the most influential activists in the great city of Boston. She's found of an organization called Violence in Boston, Inc., whose mission is to improve the quality of life and life outcomes of individuals from disenfranchised communities by reducing the prevalence of violence and the impact of associated trauma. Welcome, Monica. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you again, Rodney. Do I look any better? I shaved my <laughs> hair in the shower this morning. <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to Tito and thank you to Global Citizens. I am um, Monica Cannon Grant, an activist here in Boston, a mom of six. Uh, in 2016, ran for state representative, lost my election by 96 votes. Um, 2017, organized 45,000 people to march against racism in response to Charlottesville. In 2017, of November, became a nonprofit violence in Boston. It started off as a hashtag and I've been in violence prevention work for about 10 years due to uh, I was standing next to my son and someone put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Not once, but twice. My house has been shot up. Uh, my street has been shot up 15 times. And more recently, last year, uh, 22 times. Um, and I began to join everything I could possibly think of to figure out why. Uh, I worked for Tito Jackson for seven years running his nonprofit, but I met Tito when my house was a crime scene taped off in, in, in yellow crime tape. And he was a city councilor at the time and he showed up and I cursed him out. 
And I said, this is not normal. Um, why is this happening? But whatever you do, I want to be a part of it because I want to hold you accountable to do what you say you're going to do. Um, and from there, I ended up running his nonprofit and doing work on a community level. Um, I organized uh, a rally here in Boston against uh, the straight fried rally that they had here, which was really just white supremacists. Um, and then June 2nd, I organized a 55,000 peaceful protest in response to George Floyd. Um, I met Angie in February um, through a mutual friend of ours, and she was looking to get uh, politicians to the table in response to what was happening, what she had suffered with Andrew. Um, and we began to do the work of reaching out to elected officials. I used my relationships and leverage and some bullying a little bit, not much. Um, to get elected officials to the table. Uh, from Angie, I met Emerald, um, and I just, I fell in love with the both of them. We've been doing work for not even a long time before George Floyd was murdered. And I reached out to Angie and Emerald, and I'm like, listen, what happened to George Floyd is what happened to you guys. What can we do? And they expressed to me that they had encountered a lot of activists who had took their stories and, and took the, their power, um, but didn't allow them to speak and have capitalized off of their stories without talking to them. And so I said, okay, well, how about I organize a conversation with elected officials where you get to talk to them directly and not have to go through a middle person. Um, and we can call it a survivor-led conversation and I'll just moderate to make sure that the politicians don't over-talk you guys because sometimes they do that. And they said, cool. And so I called Elizabeth Warren because I had did a commercial for her for her presidential campaign for Black Maternal Health. Um, I called Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who I have a relationship with. She's actually my congresswoman. Um, I called Tito and I called Michael Blake. I called every elected official who would answer the phone. And I said, I have survivors that want to talk to you directly and they don't want to go through nobody else. And I sent them the three pieces of legislation, which involved the Eric Gardner law, the Andrew Curse Act, and the Stefan Clark law, which is preventing um, an officer from shooting you in your back um, as you're running away from them. And all of them were super responsive and willing to sign on. And we hosted the conversation live through Facebook Live. You can go watch it on Violence in Boston, Inc. on Facebook. And it was an amazing conversation. And, and both Angie and Emerald had the opportunity to demand that the elected officials on that call support their legislation and also help them push the bill. And not every elected official on the call agreed. Um, and so, yeah, that's the work that we've done. We've been going state to state to every politician who would listen. We've been on phone calls and panels, just trying to get people to pay attention that survivors can speak for themselves if given the opportunity. I'm currently organizing a march on June 22nd in response to Rashard Brooks, who was killed by the Atlanta Police Department while sleeping in his car. Um, and I guess for me, you know, I, I have a, a social impact center here where we're addressing um, violence through addressing the social piece of what people experience. That's the work that I'm doing. Um, I still live in a community where my house can be shot up. I still come home to bullets. I still fight this fight. Um, but I'm glad to be in community with Angie and Emerald and be able to take this fight um, across the United States to whoever would listen. And I'm gr grateful to be on this panel with Global Citizens because, you know, for so long, you, you scream and you yell. And it's so funny. I just recently made the front page of the Boston Globe and they're like, who is she? Where does she come from? And you'd be like, okay, so I've been doing this for 10 years and y'all just figuring out who I am. But um that's boston for you and 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 one of the things that we're advocating for is you know not to downplay racism regardless of what state you live in but i would rather be in the south and see confederate flags in massachusetts it's dangerous because it's silent and it's invisible so to speak it's it's the people who you would trust with your life that could possibly off you so to speak um and so it's the emts it's the police officers it's it's people in elected official positions. And so fighting here has been one of the, sh the hardest fights of my life, but I can't stop. I have six children um, who range in age from 22 to one. And so I'll fight until, until I'm not breathing anymore. I mentioned to uh, Monica last night when we met by video conference, kind of late last night, that uh, you have such an amazing story. If you run again, your first <laughs> check's coming from Texas. And now you've got a global right. family uh, that, that'll help you. 
Uh, Boston, I should mention, is such a, a great city. The circle started there, by the way. And anytime I'm in Boston, I enjoy going over to that hotel, I guess, Jerry's the Parker House, I believe. Mm. And I look at the pictures from those old circles, you know, the Dunphy family. Remember, I see a lot of their faces on here. They yeah. were the second largest donors to Jack Kennedy's first campaign for Congress. Mm -hmm. The largest donor was old man Kennedy. Uh, yeah. uh, but you did a great job. Thank you for your life's work. Uh, you. Our final panelist is Latasha Brown. Uh, I knew of her before I, I met her. Uh, I, I followed her and uh, hope at some point she moves her organization to, to Houston, if not Texas. Latasha is co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, an award-winning organizer, philanthropic consultant, political strategist, and jazz singer. I hope she'll share some with us. 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit and philanthropic circles. She worked on a wide variety of issues related to political empowerment, social justice, economic development, leadership development, wealth creation, civil rights, and all around hell raiser for good causes. Uh, would you please uh, welcome Latasha Brown. Latasha, in your own way, you ought to open up. Thank you. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. Oh, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, until the killing of black men, black mother sons, is important as a killing of white men, white mother sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. Oh, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That's a song by uh, Sweet Honey and Rock. Thank you, Sweet Honey and Rock. And I think it's so apropos to where we are right now. We who believe in freedom shall not rest until it comes. And so I am so honored um, to be here with the panelists, all of those women um, have just inspired me. I'm sitting here right now feeling very grounded and honored um, to be a part of this panel and the work that they've done. And I'm also, I just want to acknowledge that looking at these faces of people all over the country, I'm looking at you, um, you give me strength. Um, you give us strength. Like this is how transformation happens when we are in relationship with each other and we're able to empathize with each other's pain and really be able to align. Um, we will change the world. Systems are created by people. So when we decide that systems will change, systems shall change. And so the work, I just want to briefly say, um, the work of Black Voters Matter Fund, the organization I started, I'm a native of Selma, Alabama. And so I grew up while I wasn't, um, I didn't, I was born, I wasn't born yet when the civil rights movement took place. Um, I was born right after it, it happened. And so many of the people who were leading and instrumental as student leaders in the civil rights movement happen to be mentors of mine, uh, myself and, and Cliff Albright, who's the other founder of our organization. And so my shaping, my political ideology and my shaping as an organizer came from those who had worked for years and years to bring some sense of justice um, in the Deep South from a framework of peace and tapping into humanity. And so I come to that work from that space. And then I also come to this work as a Black woman who grew up in the Deep South. Um, in the state of Alabama, with all that I saw in terms of discrimination, all that I saw with the history of how my people were treated, all that I know of the history of that literally I really am the direct descendant of a person who, who was enslaved in the very land that my family owned years later when my mother was born. And so in, in, in that spirit, in that space, I think it's, you know, this moment, the work that we're doing, and I just want to tie it into how I think kind of in this conversation, this, that we, we have to recognize that we're in a particular moment. You have to know what moment you're in, that we are in a special moment. And part of what happens um, when the pain, until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, people won't change. And so currently what we're experiencing is what we see this pain and this trauma that we're experiencing right now it is actually a gift to us to really be able to change and transform so that we can literally create the world that we deserve. 
that those of us in America, that my pain is one thing, being able to feel my brothers and sisters' pain. It pained me to see children who were from Colombia and Peru and Mexico to come to this country and be treated and looking for political asylum and they're placed in cages. It troubled me. It troubled me to see my brothers and sisters literally being attacked by the government, right? And being able to see more outrage of the burning of buildings opposed to the actual um, um, killing of a life. When a building has makes us more upset than a burning of a building, there's something fundamentally wrong with us and our humanity. It pains me that we're in a space that we're thinking that ultimately it is who we have in office that determines our future forward. No, who we have in office it should be the person that's going to listen to us, to be accountable to us. And when they can't do that, they've got to go. And so even in the U.S. Constitution, it actually says that when government no longer serves the interests of its citizens, then it should be replaced, reformed, or abolished. I raise that in the context that we have to get back to this space and fully standing in our power as citizens, fully standing in our power as humanity, as human beings, that at the point when we cannot recognize the pain of another, something fundamentally has happened to us. That at the point in which we cannot literally use the strength in our power to stand in our power and leverage that for others, there's something fundamentally wrong. What gives me hope in this moment is that looking at right now currently in the United States, there are protests happening in all 50 states. That when you look at the front lines, you're looking at um, you're looking at Black people and white people and Latinx people and Asian Americans and Native Americans, and we're looking at a we're looking at a the kind of America that I want is that's the America. The America that I see is the America that's on the front lines right now. The America that is standing and has the courage to say no, that all lives matter, that at the end of the day, that the police have to be held accountable. They work for us. And so I think that we're also, while there's a lot of pain and trauma in this moment, I also think that there's a lot of possibilities around, really around, I often ask people, and I'm going to ask y'all to do this um, just quickly, and, 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 and then I'll wrap up. I'm just going to ask everybody that's watching this right now, if you can just take a moment to center yourself, kind of get, get ground and put your feet on the ground, just center yourself and close your eyes just for a second, just close your eyes. And I'm gonna ask you a question. Imagine America without racism. Imagine your country, your nation, where you're coming from without racism. Now you can open your eyes. The truth of the matter is, how many of you couldn't see anything? I do that exercise all the time because oftentimes, even when I'm lecturing at Harvard or other places, um, most of the time, 99% of people can't see anything because it's such a fabric of who we are where it's almost un unconscionable to imagine something different. But I will actually say that is our calling in this moment. Because the truth of the matter is there is nothing has been brought into existence that, that, that did not first be created with a vision. So if we can't even envision an America or a nation without racism, then we're really not serious about ever eliminating it. So at the place in which we have to start and get grounded is literally creating and holding a radical reimagining of what America could be, a radical reimagining of what the world could be. And ultimately, that's our starting place. And if we start and get grounded there, then everything else can grow out of that. So I know I'm at my time, and so I'm going to turn it back over to you, um, Tito. Um, but thank you all so much. Thank you for caring enough to listen and make yourselves open enough to listen and to particularly these women who have, this is their lives have been impacted. Their husbands, their fathers have been impacted in this space. And so ultimately, I believe I, I'm not going to say I believe in government. I'm not going to say I believe in political parties. But what I do believe in is I believe in the power of people and humanity. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, all young, uh, gifted, and woke. And uh, you made reference to Tito. I was just thinking he was on the call with us last night. 
And I was with Tito his first time in South Africa, maybe on the African continent for a circle, a global citizen circle meeting. And so that as I wrap up, why are we doing this? Why do we have people on this call from all around the globe? Uh, I heard somebody, Nadine, at one of my early circles that I went to, uh, might have been one in New York. Somebody made the comment, the last original idea was in the Quran, the Torah, or the Bible. Mm -hmm. or maybe Socrates or somebody wrote it. We are all in this together in this circle, and people are on this call from South Africa, from Brazil. You know, Boston had the first sanctions, government sanctions in this country. It was Yancey on city council that got it passed before the federal government did, while Boston dis divested from businesses who were doing business in South Africa. Uh, and then other cities and states around the country. You know, Jerry, through my traveling back and forth to Africa with you and, and your family, I detoured to Brazil one time. I saw somebody on this call from Brazil. And I met someone from the Nascimento family. Uh, he was the first black consciousness senator. They, had, they have the second largest black population in the world, but most of them won't admit they're black. The purpose of this is to talk about right now strategies around the world. Before the light goes off on this tragedy, 23 days of demonstrations. I hope I'm going to do what I can in my, in my role, my little role, to keep it going. But you heard stories from Emerald, from Angie, Latasha, Monica. We've been here before. Let's make a difference. I'll turn it back over to you, Theo. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Really, this is just a remarkable um, group of extraordinary women that we just heard from. And um, so now I, I, I want to just introduce that we are, will be going into our, our uh, smaller group discussions. And, and I think we can all agree that the, what we just heard from each of our discussion leaders um, provides rich food for thought and um, encourages that deeper kind of conversation and reflection. So our intention now is to move into the smaller groups uh, where we can have be in a more intimate setting so that you can share your thoughts and raise questions or simply listen. Um, because we know there's great value in being present and listening. We, in each of the um, smaller groups, we have a facilitator, a host who will guide you. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody back here together in about 20 minutes. And we'll hear some of the highlights um, from some of the breakout groups and then we'll wrap up our program. So um, at this point, we should be all going into our various rooms and um, hopefully the technology will all work so that that will happen momentarily. So we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, this is Aaron. Uh, I will be putting everyone into breakout rooms in just a moment. What will happen is you will, your screen will change. You'll be into a group with a, a smaller group of people. You'll have a video, you'll have audio, you'll have the ability to chat. Uh, at this point, most groups do have their, uh, their small group host already in. Um, there are a couple that I need to adjust as uh, names are not quite showing up right, so bear with me. Process it and, and share it. And then last, I think, um, there was somebody on our call from Brazil who uh, talked about storytelling. And what is very, very compelling right now is that we have these um, women not only sharing their stories with us today, but sharing their stories with the nation and that these, these bills have names, that, we're, that the names of people are being said, and that for people who might not you know, understand policy, you can understand um, the specific details of a person who in 17 minutes begs for their lives 70 times. So it's, it's those details that kind of bring us together as human beings. And, um, and this kind of forum right here, the, the, the Global Citizen Circle, is kind of, I think, what, what you know, smaller communities could need. So we're trying to figure out ways you know, to communicate, communicate, convene, gather research, and then get involved in 
legislation, um, but, but immediately all of us through voting. Thank you, Bill. I miss you. Uh, I miss you, Rhett. Good to see you. Our next one um, who chaired a group was uh, Huey Theo. Hugh, if I messed it up, you know, we in Texas, we've just butchered the King's uh, language, but she's a nurse practitioner with uh, a, a Beth Israel Deaconess the Medical Center in Boston. Huey. <laughs> okay, I just unmute myself. That's okay, Rodney. Um, at how I prefer pronouncing my name is so different from how it's spelled, so that's totally okay. It, it's pronounced Huey Tui. It doesn't look like how it's spelled, but that is okay. Um, I'm just very grateful for this opportunity. As Rodney mentioned, I'm the nurse practitioner at Beth Israel Dickiness Medical Center. I, I was a host for this uh, di small, diverse group from anywhere from Colorado to Atlanta to New Hampshire. So it was great to hear inputs from people from the ski industry like Ms. Uh, Bill was mentioned, as well as educators and people. I think the general theme is that people want to learn, want to know what they can do and looking for answers on what they want to do. Um, I think we spend, the, the main, we spend a lot of time in our group just listening to each other kind of emotions as well as what they currently doing in their role. Um, we have someone that work in the housing industry and I hope I'm not butchering um, what she told me is to figure out how to um, provide affordable housing, um, affordable housing as well as uh, how to work through some of the discriminatory and exclusion practices that have happened in the past. Uh, so I thought that was great. And we also talk a lot about you know, we have, and myself personally, we are an interracial family. We are also a law enforcement families. So the conversation is multidimensional and, and complex. So, um, you know, but just someone mentioned just having those type of conversation and exploring those topics are a type of activism. Uh, you know, we don't have to go out and march, but I think having conversation as well as addressing some of these topics with our own families um, and that they don't know some of the history behind the civil rights movement or some of the current laws are all really helpful. So some of the, those are kind of some of the themes that come up. And I'm actually learning a lot myself because I didn't, I didn't realize there was a no knock um, like policies out there that kind of didn't make sense. So I'm, I'm definitely learning a lot and this is just the place where my group was at. I hope I capture everybody's <laughs> kind of comment, <laughs> yes. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The, the next one will be Heaton Kalan, Senior Program Officer and Director of Democracy Programs at the New World Foundation and a Global Citizen Circle Director. Thank you, Rodney. Good to see you again. It's been a long time since South Africa. It has been I'm too gonna, long. I'm going to come visit you. <laughs> um, we, we had a, a, a very great group, uh, largely made up of people from Greater Boston, but uh, also joined by someone from uh, Virginia here in the US and Indonesia. Um, the, the broad theme in our group was, you know, we have the ability to make impact locally. And those, there were sort of two pieces to it. One is, what are systems in place um, so that the everyday person knows where to go when something happens to them? And where time and money are not barriers um, to, to, to see, you know, retribution or something that happened to you at the workforce or whatever that may be. Um, and, and the other piece then, part of that was, um, we know what we don't want. How, how do we start building what we do want? How do we actually um, train people and train police who actually need to deal with mental health issues. We had someone in our group who had worn the uniform for 28 years and spoke from a perspective of what uh, people in uniform are trained and not trained to do um, and are, are put into situations that they are not trained to deal with. So how are resources put into that in a way that actually serve people and serve the situation well? And so to have a dialogue and a conversation about what community needs really look like and how do we build that. Um, and the other very sort of local piece was around how is it 
tools for us to have conversations with people who we may think we, we have long-standing relationships with, but we're not sure how they're going to react. Um, so if you bring up, is it okay to bring up white fragility and not have a reaction? Um, so what are tools for conversations um, that are productive? So those are sort of the broad themes, all very local and where we can all have impact and that's what our, our group was largely about. Thank you. Thank you, Heaton. It was great to, great to see you. I'll make sure I'll follow up afterwards. I miss you. Such pleasant memories from that circle in South Africa. The last one will be Elizabeth Richards. She's director of the Chandler Center for Community Engaged Learning at Southern New Hampshire University in Manchester, New Hampshire. A place that we all should get to as soon as, as, soon as possible. Jerry, what was that boat, the last hurrah? And where would Booth Bay or Booth Harbor or something? Uh, but Elizabeth, you on. Is she muted? Is she there? Elizabeth, are you there still? Elizabeth may have had to drop off. Is Anybody else from her group, Theo? It could be from her group, or if there's somebody else who would like to um, share from their group. I, how about Catherine Riley? I see you just posted something, Catherine. Would you mind telling us what came out of your group? Catherine, I will unmute you. And it, I don't see Elizabeth on the list at this point. Okay. She, Catherine, she, you are ready to early. speak. Thank you. I'm honored, Theo. So our group was comprised of, of parents, teachers, art teachers, educators, professors, and we really focused on how the role of education and research, um, on the importance of the role of, of information exchange and research in moving toward our vision of a world without racism. So we talked about sharing stories such as our eloquent guests have done, but also just hard data about inequality by race, inequality of access, inequality of health outcomes, um, and the importance of starting that with, our, with ourselves, educating ourselves and especially educating our children. And one quote I'll throw out is, and I hope I don't butcher it. We should do many small things often. That's good. Yes. Theo, you want to open it up? I we can open it up. We've got we really have a few more minutes, and I would love to hear from anybody else who wants to share out from their group. Um, and then we'll and then we'll we'll call call it closed, but um, please, if, if there's somebody who would like to share what, um, what your group talked about, um, if you could um, maybe just write in the... I'll hold that finger up. Hold the finger. It's kind of hard for us to all see. Dr. Okay. Jazz Jackson. I saw Dr. Jazz Good. Jackson. Okay, Jazz. Great. Jazz, will you share? Yeah, Theo, uh, I'll jump in. Um, I won't reiterate things that have already been said, um, but one of the things that was brought up is really 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 understanding what the law is from all within your own areas and being able to figure out how you can make changes that can act, actually make a system impact um and another thing that really popped up was being able to um find the people who are marginalized and being able to be a bridge for them because it's it's um while it's they can be a voice. The voice is much larger when they have bridges of, around them to support them. That could be in any different spaces um, within the workplace as, as well as within protests. And just being able to understand why this work is important to not only you, but within our, within our system from your perspective and the perspective of others. I'll take a second. Um, I wanna say hello to Rodney also. Uh, I want to think we need to focus on two things. One of them is police brutality, no more chokeholds, no more shooting people in the back. Fire the policeman, prosecute the policeman. If the police chief doesn't enforce it, fire the police chief. And the other one is education. We need to work for free tuition in public colleges to lift up the whole country with more education. They'll make smarter decisions, make more money, et cetera. 
we give free college, free, we pay for school now through high school, add four more years in the college, that'll be the best thing for our country. Seven countries in Europe have free universities. We should do that too. That's it. Thank you. I saw in the chat that um, Lena Srivastava, Srivastava, sorry. Perfect. Perfect. Hi everyone. Yeah, so we had a, we had a really great discussion. Um, I wish we had had a little more time to get to, you know, sort of uh, summing it up. So I'll do that here. Um, the overriding sense from our, uh, our panelists, uh, sorry, our participants, um, who came mostly from the United States, but a couple were from abroad, from Indonesia and Ireland, um, was a sense that it's, it's really overwhelming how much every single system or every single aspect of society is affected, is, you know, sort of has, has systemic racism embedded in it, whether it's here in the United States or, or elsewhere. And people are feeling, um, on the one hand, that they want to participate, and they are, like, you know, there was so much activity. Everyone was talking about how much they were doing, even if they're not out there protesting because of COVID or because, you know, other things that how much activity everyone's doing, but they feel like they want to do more. And so one of the things we talked about was starting from where you are and making sure that you're not taking on, the, even though this is systemic, not taking on the entire system, but starting from where you are, from your industry, from your neighborhood. And also the, the question of, of self-reflection, needing to, needing to be, okay with the discomfort or the uncomfortable aspect of not knowing exactly what's happening. And the third thing was three or four people talked about the need to value others' lives, that sometimes when you're confronting someone who disagrees with you, that if you don't feel like they're valuing the humanity in others, it's very hard to talk to them, but that that's the starting point. Um, and that is, you know, sort of that's the grounding for which all people, all the people in the conversation are acting from, valuing other people's humanity. And that's sort of the core. So thanks. Thank you, Lena. Well, we've got, according to my clock, we have three minutes. And so um, I'd like to give Rodney the last word here. But before I do that, um, I just want to, again, thank all of you for your participation. And I want to let you know that, you know, this is, this is the first of many Global Citizen Circle conversations. Um, we do intend to continue this conversation about the actions people can take. We will follow up with everybody um, who's, who told us or who's on this um, Zoom chat and those who maybe didn't join us um, but had wanted to, we'll follow up, we'll send you the chat, we will talk, we will gather notes from all of the um, breakout rooms and we will um, send you the recording of the opening and the closing um, of the program. So we, we have every intention of, of keeping this alive um, as long as people want to um, talk with us about it, we are happy to be the, the platform or be a platform for that kind of, um, for that kind of, of, of voice to activism. So I'll, I'll say, um, I'll sign off. I'll say thank you. I'm not signing off. I, I'm going to pass over my virtual mic to uh, Rodney right now and let Rodney um, just Give us a closing thought or two before we formally end this program this morning. Neil, thank you for the great work you did. Bravo. Outstanding job. Thank you. And I, I want to thank the uh, Dunphy family uh, for having the vision to start this circle at the Parker House many years ago. Uh, and all of my circle advisors as, as well. Look, I, I never heard. I thought Zoom was something you did in a car. Or that song by Lionel Richie, Zoom. You remember that, Batson? Uh, but this is amazing. I was talking to the mayor of Houston at Mr. Floyd's funeral the other day, my dear friend Sylvester Turner, who was educated in Boston, by the way. And I was saying, man, this is a heck of a deal. Uh, I hate we're in a pandemic, but how else could we have gotten so many people from not just around America, but around the globe to have this discussion? In closing, I just want to encourage you, whether you're an activist, you're a religious leader, school teacher, you know, yard person, 
politician, whatever you are in your space, you figure out what you can do. And as old Reverend Jackson used to say when he put out that Southern drawl, his roots, right now, what can you do right now during this moment of change? Thank you.